Well, it's a frightening distinction to be following Arianna Huffington. Um, I'm grateful, however, that she gave me the perfect setup in two ways. One, it's nice to be another foreign woman telling Americans how you should think about things. <laughs> All in favor of that. And the second is her last point about disconnection from the internet is a really nice setup for what I wanted to do for the next nine minutes and counting down, which is tell you about how the internet's being reinvented. And I want to talk about the internet that's beyond this room, where I know it is somewhat erratic, to the rest of the world. And I want to use this map here as a framing device. This is a map that documents effectively hotspots for internet activity. You'll notice that they concentrate in places in some ways that we are most familiar with. And what I want to do is tell you the stories about the places that are not quite so orange on this map. And I want to do it the way only an anthropologist can, which is with five photos and five short stories. This is Tarawi, population 150, 220 kilometers north of Adelaide. It's my second home. It's the place, Ariana, I go to switch off because there is no internet in Tarawi. And when you ask people, can you get the internet or where might the internet be, what people say to you is the internet's in Port Piri. The internet in this case is a destination. Port Piri, as it turns out, is 150 kilometers away from this town. You have to drive to the internet. When you get there, you discover it's in a McDonald's, which is perhaps not the place we associate with the glamorous life of Web 2.0. But when I want to do my email in Tarawi, I drive to the internet. When you sit down in the pub and you say to people, what's it going to take to get the internet here? I mean, we do have broadband in Australia. You could have it. The guys will muscle up to the pub, and we're talking about shearers and cockies and farmers. And they'll say, listen, Genevieve, it's a choice between a contract for broadband or a cattle dog. I know what a cattle dog delivers. You're like, well, listen, there's all these other values to the internet. It's about information, entertainment, you know, interesting kind of content and experiences. And they'll look you in the eye and say, we have television for the footy, and we have mobile phones for pornography. What else do we need? <laughs> Story one about the internet, it's 100 kilometers away. Story two about the internet is one where the internet isn't in real time, which I understand was the experience in this room this morning. This comes from my colleagues who have been doing fieldwork in Orissa in India. This is a company called United Villages who've actually worked out how to have the internet run not in real time. What you're looking at here is a young man at effectively a dumb terminal. Ooh, that's so not me. A young man at a dumb terminal, at the dumb terminal, he has a choice of five things he can do on the internet. He can order things from effectively a fairly low-tech e-commerce site. He can find himself a wife. He can look up things on Wikipedia. He can send email, or he can check effectively crop prices. You enter into a table what it is you want to do. When the bus comes through this little tiny town, it picks up all the information, literally, through a wireless router, and deposits it again when it gets to a big city. A day later, the information comes back to you. That may sound profoundly unsatisfying to most people in this room, but it turns out for pretty much any one of those things, 24 hours to 48 hours is not a great catastrophe. You don't need a wife in real time. Mo well, most of us don't. Most Wikipedia requests don't need to happen in real time, you know, despite what we think when we're down the pub arguing about who it was that won the 1968 World Cup. You don't actually need to know in real time. And in this particular set of villages, and arguably in lots of places around the world where we've spent time, the internet that is asynchronous still delivers the value that many of us understand the internet brings. It's about information that's relevant to us. It's about bridging time and distance. It's about creating communities of practice and interest. It just doesn't have to happen immediately. Story number three about the internet. I was in Indonesia four years ago doing field work. I was looking for people who considered themselves and self-identified as regular users of the internet. And I found myself in this woman's home. And we're talking, we talked about her life and her kids, and she's got a daughter in Australia, so we had lots to talk about there. To be the things she cares about and what she hopes for her family. And we finally get around to talking about the internet, and at this point I've kind of twigged to the fact there's no electricity in the house. But I've spent a lot of time in emerging markets, and I know that truck batteries run the internet perfectly well. And we talk some more, and I'm starting to think, wait, you've said you don't actually read or write. Interesting. And then I realize there's no computer. And I sort of go, time out. <laughs> you said you use the internet. I don't understand what it is that you're doing. She's like, well, my son comes. And I say to him, I want to send the email to my daughter. And I talk about what I want it to be in the email. And he goes away, and he comes back and tells me what she said. And clearly, the piece I'm missing there is that the son is going to a cyber cafe, typing his mother's message in. The message is coming back, and he's coming and telling his mother what's in it. 
And again, here's another experience of the internet that in some ways isn't the one we have. But when I looked at her, I thought, I can't really argue with this. This is about being in touch with your family. Again, it's about collapsing time and space and distance. It's about an experience of the internet that in many ways looks like the ones we have, but it didn't need a computer. It didn't need a keyboard. It didn't need a graphic interface. And for millions and millions of users around the world, this is how the internet is being encountered. Through mobile phones, through third party intermediaries, through these kind of second and third steps away from the technology that we're used to, the internet has taken on a kind of realm of being imagined as well as being real. This is one of my favorite illustrations from a government website possibly ever. This is from the Korean government's most recent uh, set of technology declarations called the Use Society Doctrine, where the Korean government has set out an agenda about what technology will deliver to Korean society. They've made an incredibly clear link between citizenship and consumption and production of new technologies, specifically the internet. And here, use of the internet in its fullest dimensions is a way of being a good Korean. The government has a series of websites set up to help you encounter the future of the internet, and this is one of them. It's at a site called the Ubiquitous Dream Hall, and it offers a whole set of snapshots into what the future of the internet might look like in a very Korean context. And this is one of the graphical representations of what that future is. Now, I can't explain why there are sulfur-crested cockatoos here, uh, which is what's sitting up on that tree, which is actually an apartment building, but I can decode some of the rest of this for you. Each one of those trees is actually a representation of a high-density apartment complex. The man in the laptop is kind of clear. The satellite is another way of talking about how connectivity is happening, and there's a man in the distance there with a cell phone in his hand, and then a happy little robot appearing on the side there who is orange which is what makes robots happy, apparently, in this particular version of the future. And what you have here is this wonderful manifestation of a future imagining of the internet that, again, I suspect is not the one we think of. When we think of social networking, when we think of Web 2.0, it's not one that has parrotfish and sulfur-crested cockatoos and a kind of soft, bleeding edge of cartoonness. But for me, it's fascinating. And last but not least, I want to leave you with the notion of an internet imagined. When I was in Malaysia doing field work, I was in a small town in southern Malaysia. I walked into a shop and it was full of paper technology. Uh, in this particular part of Malaysia and indeed across the Chinese diaspora, when your relatives die and once a year at a particular festival, you burn paper goods. The fire transforms those paper goods into real goods and your ancestor is appropriately equipped to continue to live their life in the other world that they're now inhabiting as dead people. Turns out, in this particular town in Malaysia, and indeed again across the Chinese diaspora, people burn paper cell phones, paper flat panel televisions, paper laptops, paper desktops, paper playstations. Uh, when you ask people, as one gets to do as an anthropologist, who are your relatives calling? Are they calling you? Look at me and go, don't be ridiculous, they're calling each other. Like, okay. And then you ask about what does that mean? And people are like, well, we upgrade their mobile phones every year. You know, we don't want them to be kind of out of style and out of fashion. So here's this entire cosmology that's operating in many ways in a parallel existence to the one we operate in now. It turns out in this parallel world, this afterlife in Chinese culture, there's also the internet. Technology is burnt with all of its attributes. Here's a laptop running the internet in ways we would all profoundly recognize. And what I want this image to suggest here is that the internet's not just real. It's also become an icon. It's also become a symbol. And in these ways, it's imagined. And the most remarkable thing about it to me here is that it suggests in this particular culture that this is such an important thing. Not only can you not be alive without it, but you can't be dead without it either. Last but not least, I want to say, what does all of that mean, right? There are five very different stories. A story of an internet perhaps permanently deferred, of non-users and perhaps ex-users. A story of the internet that's asynchronous, which defies some of our notions of what the internet should be. A story of the internet that's not in real time, of one that is so futuristic that perhaps we wouldn't recognize it. And one that is, in some ways, imagined and not real. So what do all of those things tell us? Well, as an anthropologist, I think it means that this is not just about a technology. This is about all the things that underpin it. And those things are social and cultural. And they have resonances far beyond what is happening in this room and in all of our lives. And getting our hands around all of that stuff about what the diversity of experiences and the diversity of expectations are is what it is we have to look forward to. So I wanted to end it there and say thank you.